people have no idea how expensive yeah. it is to make I these know, videos. It's fucking crazy. Like the first week of COVID, when everybody was hiding, we were, I was calling people like, "Can I get into your listing?" They're like, "Are you crazy?" I'm like, "Can I get into your listing?" First, it was $10 million homes, and it was $50 million homes, then it was $250 million homes. Then we were like, what else we can get access to that no one can? Sure. Yachts. What are some of the coolest homes for celebrities that we might know that you can tell us about? Let's see, that's a good question. How did you get Tommy Hilfiger to go on camera? Oh, Andy, how far can I go on this? <laughs> you can see, like, if you really look through my eyes, like, I am dead. I'm <laughs> so tired. <laughs> Our next guest single-handedly ruined my YouTube career. Ennis Yilmazer is here. He's in the house. He's a three-time windsurf world champion, which makes tons of sense, who later uh, on found out that his passion was in real estate, actually. Um, and he's toured over 200 homes now on camera on his channels, 20 different countries, and over a billion dollars worth of real estate and he's walked through and his style, the way he does it, everything. He's built a massive brand. Uh, it's a personal brand on the way he does these tours. It's been pretty awesome to watch. He's toured homes with your favorite creators, me being one of them. We've done a bunch of them together. We actually just shot a huge one here in New York City. So that's why he's here uh, in from LA. So today we're going to talk to him about why he dropped his real estate license. Like what? What it was like inside Michael Jordan's home in Chicago and the business he's building behind the scenes. So with that, Ennis, welcome to Business of Influence. Thank you guys for having me. This is awesome. That was a solid rundown, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. That made me think, I was like, oh, that all happened in four years. Has it just been four years? Wow. Little less than four years, believe it or not. So here's where I kind of want to start, because there's a, a, you know, we know each other and there's so much we could talk about. So you're a Turkish windsurfing champion who now does property tours on YouTube. Correct. For like a career. Yes, with a team of 17. With a team of 17. Yeah. <laughs> what? How? I know, dude. What? I don't understand. No idea. Explain it, explain. Um, so I moved to US when I was 17 years old for college mm -hmm. and I got a windsurfing scholarship. Back then I was Wait. a pretty good windsurfer. Who gives windsurfing scholarships? You get scholarships for like football, baseball, Correct. like being really smart. So I went to Texas A&M and when we applied for it, right around that time, I got my, I was third in the world in windsurfing. What? At the age of 16. Wow. So. Do they have windsurfing at Texas A&M? Well, it's a, where, it's it's a, a Texas A&M yeah. has a university or a campus in Corpus Christi, right ah, by the water. Right on the water. So that was the second, uh, that's the second biggest Texas A&M campus. And, um, Crazy. We applied, we were like, look, I don't play basketball, but I windsurf. And they were like, we're open to it. So they gave me first a half scholarship, then eventually converted into a full. Wow. And that was 2007. I windsurfed, windsurfed, won a couple world titles. And when I was 21 years old, I bought a house during the 08 crisis. Uh, in Corpus Christi? Or? Yeah, in Corpus Christi. And it was a flip. And it was about 80% complete, and they ran out of money. Got it. So I bought this place. And I remember talking to my dad. He goes, how are you going to finish this? You don't have any more money left. I was like, I'm going to do it myself. So he flew in from Turkey and we spent 45 days finishing the house. I was like, as soon as I'm done with uh, windsurfing, real estate is next. I loved it. You love finishing the house? like the Just like building process. the house, something about building with your own hands felt so good. I was like, I have to do this. This is my calling. So I windsurfed till 26, 27, fully retired, went into real estate development. Did that nonstop for three years, day and night. I was working seven days a week. Through the recession. Because then you got nailed in 08. Well, 08, but I started around like 2016, 17, flipping okay. homes. So okay, gotcha, the economy gotcha. was good. Yeah, yeah. I did it close to 25 to 30 homes, give Crazy. or take. In and around Corpus Christi? Yes. And uh, like, if you would come to my project sites, you would assume that I'm one of the construction workers. Yeah. Like framing belt tools, everything. In I the learned Texas everything. heat and everything. Yes, that's right. And after that, I was like, what's next? I was like, I made money. I'm doing fine. I packed everything and moved to LA. That was four years ago. And Have here you we gone are. back? No. See the houses? I went back once. One of the houses I built burned down. Oh! Luckily not because of me, but it was interesting. It was the house that I worked the longest on. I cared oh. about this house so much, it almost killed me. And uh, 
during one of like the holidays, fireworks goes into the house oh and burns it oh while the owners are not there. So there wow. you go. Oh. Um, and yeah, four years ago, went to LA, got my license because I didn't know if I wanted to get into development right away. I was like, I'll get my license. I'll just look around some houses and figure out. Three months into having a license, I called Mikey, uh, who's my business partner and person behind the camera. I'm like, look, I have an idea. Why don't we do tours on the weekends? We'll go check out some houses. It will help my real estate career. That's how it all started. And then later on, we focused on videos and here we are. But how, can you talk to us about like just change for a second? Cause one, you leave your country. Like that's, I've never done that. Andy's never done that, right? It's like that's, that's a hard thing to do. And then you leave the only sport you've ever known, the whole reason you came to this country and then you leave the next thing and then you leave the next, like you do like hard, hard cuts. There's no like wading into the water. So like, oh, nope, done, next. I mean, like I don't live with fear. Um, I do whatever feels right, really. And uh, it was actually really difficult to move from Turkey to here because I couldn't speak a word of English. Oh. So it was so difficult the first year and a half. It was a grind. I learned how to speak English watching How I Met Your Mother and Cat Williams. <laughs> as weird as that sounds, really. Cat Williams. And um, I did windsurfing and I won a couple world titles, but <clears throat> as I was traveling, I've been to same country so many times. I'm like, okay, I won, I became a youth world champion. I could become a world champion in men's division, but I was like, what does that get me? I don't know. It just didn't feel like it would have fulfilled me. Then as soon as I flipped my home, I was like, this is a lot of fun. I can learn a lot. And when I stopped windsurfing and got into development, I was like, I'm gonna learn this business in and out. And yeah. ironically enough, it made the foundation, it built the foundation of who I am today and how I can do these tours. Yeah. That's how I know them. I never built $10 million homes. I've never really sold $10 million things either. It's really all from construction or flipping $200,000 homes. So I went full force into it. And every project I told myself, I will hire the best contractor in town for a specific task. And my contingency with working with them would be, I'm gonna pay you a full price, but I'm gonna be your helper. Yeah. And you're gonna teach me how you're gonna do this stuff. I'm gonna learn all the ins and outs, and I'm gonna learn how I can run it more efficiently next time. So from plumbing to framing, to pouring concrete, to doing drywalls, to painting, window installation, doors, you name it, I've done every single thing you can think of. And that's why I walk around confident in these properties because I'm like, bring any realtor or contractor you want. I welcome it. Because you've done it. I've done it. You've built it. Yeah, so that kind of got us a good foundation and I just had to learn how to act in front of camera, which for a foreigner can be quite challenging. And especially when you have millions of people watching you where you say the single wrong thing and it's just like, there's 100 comments on it. So I was like, well, I'm an ambitious person. I'm sure I can improve myself over time. That's really what we did. I don't even know how we got here. Like, honestly, it's just like, we just focused on making better videos. You just said that uh, as a foreigner, obviously you, you said also that you didn't know how to speak English very well. Uh -huh. A lot of people today struggle to be in front of the camera, even though they're native English speakers. What was it for you that motivated you? That What was that thing that got you to do it? Um, anytime I feel fear, I go right against it. Like, I hate to feel uncomfortable. It really bothers me. So I try to figure out what bothers me and I just get better at it. I was like, this sucks, I'm gonna do more. I mean, Ryan, you can relate to this. Mm -hmm. You're in someone's $50 million property. They're watching every word you say. You're not the listing agent. You just have enough of a following to get access. And that's immense amount of pressure. And people are like, oh, you're so casual in front of camera. You have no idea what's going through my mind. Walk in this property, there's a time clock. You wanna sound knowledgeable. You wanna build that opportunity to the next. So you wanna really take advantage of the moment. And going through all these feelings, you just do it. Like there's no better answer, you just do it. And if you fail at it, there's ways to fix it. And then you, you do it better next time. How much money can you make as a professional windsurfer? I'm like, I'm still thinking about this windsurfing. I think at peak, I made like 125 a year. Okay. While you're, cause you were doing it, were you doing it after college? I was doing during college and after college, yeah. Got it. Yeah. How many people and, were on the team? So 
I was basically in the NBA of windsurfing. It's the called NBA of windsurfing. Correct. So it's not called, the NFL of windsurfing, the NBA. Okay. NBA sounds better. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's called PWA. Okay. And we travel anywhere from eight to 10 countries a year mm. to do these events. You have to qualify to be one of the 64 who can complete, uh, who can compete. And it's basically every single round, they divide you up to eight people and then you race four qualifies, four qualifies, and you have winner's final and loser's final. And you do these multiple el eliminations. And at the end, you know, you rank on the event and you rank on the tour. So that's what I did from, let's see, it's all mixing up. And I think from 18 to like 26, that's what I did. It's and I traveled time. a lot. I traveled over 40 countries. It's eight years. Eight years. It's a long time. I have really good sponsors. Uh, I was sponsored by Turkish Airlines. I flew business class nonstop for six years yeah. all around the world. Uh, at my peak, I would travel with anywhere from 400 to 600 pounds of gear. Oh, wow. I would have like seven, eight big bags with me. I traveled the world with it. I think that's where my like resilience and hard work comes from. It is such a difficult sport. It's so abusive on the body. During a competition day, you can burn upwards of 12,000 calories a day. Oh I would God. literally spoon feed myself pasta, plates after plates, just to maintain my weight. So that really taught me how to be resilient and like work hard and maintain motivation, I guess. And then when I started doing this, I was like, dude, all I have to do is wear suits and walk around. This is easy. It's a joke. <laughs> well, I want to go I back really to what mean you it. said about knowledge because, I mean, we do wear suits and walk around, but you have to speak to your client because your client knows what the materials are used in the construction and everything. How did you learn in these $20 million apartments? What were the resources? How did, who was the knowledge that? So yeah. if you can fundamentally understand how a house is put together, it applies to all, really. Yeah. You know? Once the property gets to $100 million, they use a little bit different materials. Maybe some of the finishes are different, but fundamentals are the same. And one of the things that I felt like it was lacking in the system was you would see these agents showcasing properties, but they couldn't convey why these properties cost so much. You know, yes, there's real estate involved in location, but a lot of times between permitting, how difficult it is to build these homes. There are kitchens out there that cost two, three million dollars just on cabinetry and countertops. And I just felt like these agents would come in towards the very end of the construction, not all of them, but most of them. They don't really have a full grasp of the property and they never build properties themselves. So they always lack that authentic care or like emotional attachment to the property. Every time I walked in, I'm like, man, this developer spent so much money and so much time I'm gonna do my best to convey it. And I think it resonated with people. And I think it gave people a reason to really watch and stick stick around for the video. They're like, oh, I didn't know that about houses. Sure. Anytime I meet a fan, they're like, dude, every time we go into a kitchen, we look for a waterfall edge. Every time we go to a bathroom, we look for a rain head. Like people started appreciating the fact that we were pointing out how to evaluate a house, I guess in a way. So I think everybody found something different. A lot of designers were watching it because we were getting access to cra crazy properties. So many real estate offices I went to, they're like, we give your videos to our new agents to, to say like, you watch him and try to talk like him when you're showing properties. And obviously throughout the journey, I've improved myself too. You know, I, I've dived into more architecture, understanding properties. I mean, you know this, every time I go to these shoots, I end up meeting the developer or the agent or the yeah. owner. So I get that one-on-one -on -one connection with them. And I just try to reflect that. I try to, I just empathize for these people. It's really hard to build these homes. So I try to do my best or I talk about them as if it's my property. Mm -hmm. That's why sometimes I'm really pain in the ass for our team. They're like, why is it has to be so perfect? I'm like, one day you'll spend $20 million in five years of your life to build something, then come to me and say that. Till that point, whatever I say goes. That's how it is. So you, you made like the hard line decision to, no, nah, I've done houses now for, for years and years. I'm not gonna do those anymore. I'm moving to LA. Was the goal to develop property, to become a broker? Honestly, I didn't know. Oh. I just knew that- You just wanted to switch things up. Switch things up and I just knew that I'm a very competitive individual. I felt like if I would go to LA, I would be surrounded by people that are way more competitive than my environment in Texas. Sure. And I just knew that it would affect me the right way. And I was like, look, 
I could, I almost bought a property, in fact, when I moved to LA to develop, but I was like, you know what, dude, just take it easy. Just enjoy life for a minute. I worked my whole life. So I was like, I'm just gonna get my license, go to some brokers opens, check it out, you know, see what it's about. In fact, it's a fun story. When I moved to LA, I'm just like so into doing something. Yeah. And at the beginning, I didn't have a ton of things to do. So I had a nice car. I was like, I'm gonna do Uber Lux. What kind of car do you have? I have a Mercedes S Class. Okay. So I was like, you can qualify for Uber Lux. I was like, how can I meet people? I didn't know anyone in LA, like zero. I had two friends. So you, you were a real estate developer in Texas. You moved to LA to drive Uber? Correct. At the beginning, spice things up. Yeah. Um, well, I did that. Like, Great well, way to meet strangers. Exactly. Great way to picture like uh, that you're a realtor. So I met a <laughs> lot of people. And ironically enough, all the money I made, I lost it all because I would drive for like two days and hit a pothole and it would be thousand dollars to fix my rim and it would all go to zero. Um, but at the beginning, I was just kind of feeling out the environment. Then I realized that being a real estate agent is kind of fun. You meet a lot of people. I was literally showing like rental apartments for $3,000, whatever I can get my hands on. Where'd you hang your license? Compass. Okay. It was Compass Beverly Hills office. And uh, in two, three months, I was the busiest guy in the office. I basically took most of the realtors um, rental listings, put it on Craigslist. Yeah. And I was doing showings for them. I'm like, look, if someone calls you, I know you don't want to show it. Yeah. They're only going to make like $2,000. I will show it to them for you. If they rent it, great. You make all the commission. I just work for you for free. What? But if they don't want to rent it, I'll take them as a client. Got it. Everybody gave me their listings. Sure. In three to four months, I was so busy. I did like 25 rentals on my first year. And that's how I really started working out. I mean, networking and just kind of understanding the city. And obviously that gets you in the rhythm of doing deals. Sure. And while I was doing that, I was seeing so many properties. I was going through Brokers Open and I was looking around. I'm like, these are crazy properties. How come nobody's like vlogging this? How come nobody's talking about this? I was like, this is crazy. And that's why I called Mikey. I'm like, look, I have an idea. I'm not making any money. Why don't you come to LA, sleep on my couch, and on the weekends we'll go do tour open houses and we'll do videos. It'll help me as an agent and then uh, it'll be a cool thing for you to do and we'll see where it goes. So it what was, was the first video? Yeah. What was, what was the first one? Just like Brokers Open. We literally started rolling with a GoPro. Is that still live on your channel? Not the first one. I think Mikey took it down because he's so <laughs> embarrassed of it. But I think second and the third video, they're all on the channel. And still to this day, Mikey's like, we have to take these down. I'm like, no, I want people to know that we started with a GoPro. Like really, and you can see they're terrible. They're so bad. I mean, they're embarrassing, but we were basically walking around and some of them, we were embarrassed to ask the agents like if we can shoot a bite or two in a sure. bathroom. So I was just going around the properties, talking about certain details. Then we kind of enjoyed the process. Then we were like, okay, instead of touring multiple properties, maybe we should just pick one and spend like three, four hours. We did that and videos started doing a little bit better. Then we were like, hmm, what if we spent like a full day and like really hone in and write an intro, not wing it. We started doing really well. And you weren't making any money on YouTube yet. This is just literally to build your real estate business. I would say like first 12 to 18 months, it was like burning money. If yeah. anything, I was financing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we started really making videos and then COVID happened. I'm like, this is our calling. Let's go full in. I told, at the time our team was Mikey, me and Jason. I've, I've told them, I was like, don't go anywhere. Don't see anyone. Don't get sick. We're gonna make videos. And literally like the first week of COVID when everybody was hiding, we were, I was calling people like, can I get into your listing? They're like, are you crazy? I'm like, can I get into your listing? And while everybody was taking easy, we went full speed and um, it took off. So what do you think your your secret is? Because what, what's your follower count now? Like, what, just give us some numbers, some like I metrics. Think 3, 130, somewhere around there. Across. I don't even know the exact, no, that's one of them. <laughs> yeah. That's the main channel. Yeah. The second one is like 650-ish. We have a Turkish channel that's 210. I think our Instagram is at like 350,000, TikTok around 400,000. Yep. That's kind of like the breakdown. Got it. Yeah, I think main channel on a bad month gets about 16 million views. No shorts, all long form. How many videos do you put out a month? One. Just one a month? Just one a month. How long does it take to make that one? 
from the second it, you see the script? Between uh, scheduling, preparing, shooting, editing, anywhere from 250 to 400 hours. Man hours. Got it. To make one video. I like that. Oh, uh, sorry. My bad. Did I say one a month? Yeah, you said one a month. Okay. One a week. My bad. That's what I thought. That that makes it even yeah, no, 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 no. more difficult. Slow down, that'd be <laughs> no, 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 great. One a week. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Why we have 70 people? Just one. So you just said that you would go into these brokers opens. So would they ever be against you being there? Were they ever uncomfortable? I mean, at the beginning, we got some pushback on agents. Not so much because smart agents were like, well, I don't care if you have a license, as long as you bring a buyer with these videos, you know, God bless you. Yeah. But some of them were like, nah, I don't want you to like take my listing and leverage it, yada, yada, yada. And it was around the time we met Andy, our CEO now, and his business partner, Matt. And one of the first things uh, Andy brought to the table was, you have to drop your license yeah. as early as possible. For sure. As quickly as possible. And at the time it didn't really hit me, but, as we focus more and more and more, I realized it's better that we don't have any conflict of interest. We do this simply for sake of content. And um, I was already not working as an agent anyways. Because you found oh, a passion now in exactly. showcasing properties instead of selling them. Exactly. So I had like few clients that I was working on. I closed all of them and then we did a video. I remember it so well. Yeah, I, remember. I think we were around like half a million subscribers. And Andy and his business partner were like very adamant about us making this video. I'm like, dude, no one cares. No one is gonna watch this. We're gonna get 10,000 views. He's like, you gotta announce this, make it a big deal. I'm like, I literally for months, I was like, no one cares. No one's gonna watch this. So I finally caved in and made this like four minute video. And we like pre-released the video, but like, I forgot what you call on YouTube. You can actually comment on it. Yeah, yeah. You can watch it yet. Yeah. Premiere, there you go. And I think when the video started going live, we had 40,000 people on standby because oh. title was, I quit. Ah. And we were just around the time. Yeah, it's a like, good hook. Exactly, it had a good hook. And like for the first minute and a half, it sounded kind of suspicious, like as if we were quitting real estate. And I couldn't believe the amount of people that cared. I was like, it blew my mind away. It was like the comment section was just like, you couldn't even read the comments anymore. It was so many comments. And I was like, maybe that was the right move, you know? And then uh, it was definitely the right move. Like I said, I wasn't working as an agent anyways anymore, like three to four months prior to that. And then just hone in, full focus on YouTube. Got it. So what's the secret to a great video now? You've been able to build this, build, uh, this business, right? You've been able to build this brand, millions of followers, right? People know you all over the world now. They recognize you. You're in their phones mostly, right? Showcasing luxury properties and now different things. You're now doing yachts, experiences man. and yachts and all over the place. <laughs> um, uh, so what's the secret? Because lots of people try it, doesn't work. So here's how I look at it and it might be a little bit twisted, but when you look at your YouTube analytics and you read that your videos have been watched for like, several million minutes a month, it makes you think that's so much human life consumed by these videos Yeah, that we should spend every minute to focus on how we can curate and make each moment in the video as good as possible. Whether it's the route you take in the house, whether it's the information you cover, whether it's the structure of your video where you start at the entry or at the backyard. I started piecing out all the components of the video and started really diving into those sections. How can we improve it? How can we pick a uh, music for a montage that really sets the mood for the rest of the tour? And how can we embrace that? Can we pre-plan that? And that's honestly why we have 17 team members because we care about these videos so much. Like we make six videos a month in total, 17 people, and we work nonstop. Yeah. I mean, I have no life. I work seven days a week. I wake up at 8 a.m. and go on my desk and I work as late as I could, like till I can anymore. Literally, that's my schedule. I have no schedule. Um, and focusing on those components really allowed us to just find these like aha moments of like, oh, we can do it this way. We can hook it better. We can flow it better. We can actually put fun facts and figures throughout the tour to keep the audience engaging. And obviously touring better assets help mm -hmm. and uh 
First, it was $10 million homes, and it was $50 million homes, then it was $250 million homes. Then we were like, what else we can get access to that no one can? Sure. Yachts, let's go. We got access to a $100 million yacht about a year and a half ago. Our first yacht tour ever is the most viewed yacht tour on YouTube. Crazy. Uh, you know some of the houses that we toured? Yeah. We're like, let's travel. And adding all those layers and components and caring about these videos, it's really this secret. Like this. No secret. If someone works and puts the time that we put into these videos, their videos would be good too. We're just very relentless and we don't give up because we release a video and it goes 10 out of 10 on the ranking on YouTube. I'm like, well, next time we'll get them. You know, let's go. What do the 17 people do? <sighs> I question that sometimes too. <laughs> uh, it sounds like it's a significant amount of editing work, right? Yes. So you have me and Mikey. Then we have Andy, our CEO, uh, Matt, our production manager. Then we have Armand, Jason, uh, Colin, our videographers. Then we have Jimmy, Don, who is our editors. Then we have Luis, who's our uh, production assistant, also an editor. Let's see who else I'm forgetting. Then we have three members in Philippines part-time. Then we have Sandra, our Doing social string outs and stuff like that for you? Just like uh, short form content, yeah, man sure. managing our clips channel. Then we have Sandra for social media uh, management, and then we have Victoria, operations manager. That's a lot of people, 17 it's people. It's okay, if your name yeah. wasn't mentioned, so then <laughs> maybe check your email. That's yeah, <laughs> um, that's kind of the rundown. How yeah. are you monetizing your channels to be able to inspire 17 people's careers? <sighs> I or mean, pay them. You pay them. And I, I Let's inspire. talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. Our monthly overhead is well over six, six figures a month. Yeah. So it's insane. And we run it out of I LA. Those, I remember those days. Yeah. Uh, it, it goes up real quick. Yeah. Like before you know, you're like, holy shit. Like, where's all this money going? Yeah. Um, people have no idea how expensive yeah. it is to make I these know, videos. It's fucking crazy. Like, I read this one comment. Uh, we tore Tommy Hilfiger's yacht. And then they were like, NS, I hope you had the courtesy to tip the crew since you stayed on the yacht. I'm like, you gotta tip 15% of the charter price. It's a half a million dollars a week. Yeah. Like, what does people think we make? Like, you know, it's like, do you have any idea how expensive it is to run this organization? Yeah, tips of, except I've taken, I've done yacht trips in, in Greece and it's like that tip day is like, is it like a painful day? Yes, it it's a very insane. painful day. Like you don't realize how much money they're expecting after the yacht costs and the fuel, and then you're like, they go to fuel up and you're like, oh, you gotta pay. I'm like, wait, is it for me? I do? That's not, <laughs> a, that's not like the electric bill that gets like paid by somebody. Wait, can we talk about that? Because I've never been on a yacht. What are the additional expenses? You'll never expenses? be on a yacht, it's fine. We'll do this. <laughs> what are the additional expenses? Um, so you pay the charter price, then you pay crew price. Yep. Uh, all like the food, any supplies that you require, any drinks, bottles, whatever. Then at the end, they fuel it up and they're like, oh, like you wanted to go to this many places and we burned this much fuel. So, and then, and then you, you gotta pay them. and you gotta tip the crew, which is around In like cash, five to 10, sometimes 15%. So it builds up quick. Like you would see that it's a half a million dollar charter. You're really walking away with like three quarters of a million. Yeah. For a week. In expenses. In expenses, which is like, it's insane. It's a lot to spend one week. <laughs> it's a lot, but um, we monetize all of our channels, obviously. So that helps. Um, I would say this, I think we're one of the biggest YouTube channels that has grown to this scale without selling a product, selling a course, selling a merch. Yeah. It's simply been on um, YouTube monetization, sponsorships. Obviously we charge for our videos. And you charge now. Yeah, we charge now. You, never, I, you didn't used to. I didn't used to. Because you wanted the content. I wanted the content and we were still growing, but we're at a point now, we're probably gonna make 70 videos this year, all channels combined. And it's so hard to get allocation. I think, Andy, tell me if I'm wrong. We probably get three to 400 inquiries a month. Minimum, uh, people all around the world want us to tour their yachts or their um, houses. So she's going through seeing like, exactly what's, good, what's nice. Andy and our operations manager uh, go through all these inquiries. They kind of slim it down to like 25 to 30. Yeah. They present it to me, we discuss, and we pick like five or six a month basically, and that's it. And they're all happy to pay, and it's so hard to get an allocation, and that's how we also kept the premium. Sure. I feel like because we were doing less and better, it helped with the viewership, and it's a crazy of an equation. Think about it, like I'm gambling the success of this operation on six videos. Like there's no room for error. Like they all have to turn out really darn good. We can never have, an 
any back end problems because then we're screwed. We need these videos, these surface areas to monetize our content and keep our branding and our marketing in a way. So it's a very tough equation. Um, my mentor in Turkey, he used to run the biggest GSM operation company and he had hundreds of thousands of employees. And I remember asking him about our organization, like getting some advice from him. He goes, it's one of the most complex businesses I've ever seen. He goes, it's so goddamn dynamic. It moves so fast and it's like, it's so fragile. Like you have to be so on top of it every single day, every single moment. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think many people are gonna attempt to run it at a level and at a quality that we managed to do. Sure. I think one of the things that that separated your videos from everyone else's, like including ours, right? Because I do this, I, I sell real estate as a as a career, right? On top of everything else. So the the tours were always secondary. It's like, oh, we have access to this, let's go do it. If there's something cool, let's go do it. Um, but they tend to be quick. Like I just made a tour of a property we have up on Fifth Avenue. I think I had how much time did we have to do? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 20 <laughs> minutes max. I had 20 minutes max, we come in, boom, 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 what are the notes, let's go, let's run through, and then I gotta get to my next appointment. Or I gotta go like pitch someone who's selling their $40 million townhouse, I gotta run, I gotta do this. But you dedicate a significant amount of time to make one piece of content, put your whole life into it, and then your videos are always longer. Yes. Right, so like, you know, we were putting out videos that were like five to 15 minutes and all, and then Ennis would come out with a video that's like 30 to 45 minutes long, and you're just talking the whole time, like just getting super tingly about grout, right? And like caulking and all the <laughs> shit you love. I mean, look, when we started forming these videos, we took a lot of feedback from the audience. Sure. And one of the things that people asked was, we wanna see the whole house. At the beginning, it was cute. It was $4 million homes, there were 5,000 square feet. We're like, oh yeah, we'll do the whole thing, no problem. Which bedroom you wanna see? We'll go into the bathroom. Then it scaled up, scaled up. And then we're like, hey, uh, this house is 100,000 square feet. Yeah. There's like 18 bedrooms. <laughs> like, You wanna see I, all of them? I, I remember our team coming to us, they're like, do we need to shoot all the bedrooms? Like, are you gonna tour every single one of them? So obviously we've gotten better at telling the story and still giving that full, like, full scope tour but they're so big. Yeah. Think about it. Our Tommy Hilfiger video is 51 minutes. And uh, when we send that video- For the to, yacht. For the yacht. Yeah. When we send that video out to Burgess, the listing brokerage, I almost was like, buckle up, listen, listen. This is good, just give it a shot. I know it's crazy. You guys gave us a yacht to shoot, but it's 51 minutes. But when you think about it, in 51 minutes, we tour every single room on the yacht in detail. In detail, we showed you eight different meals. We showed you how we enjoyed the yacht, you know, with the sea toys and all that. We, yeah, interviewed, the, we interviewed the owner, Tommy Hilfiger. He's in the video. We interviewed six staff. We gave you multiple voiceovers. We covered so much in 51 minutes, it's densely packed. And if you read the comments, you can tell some people clicked on it with hesitation. And they're like, this is by far the best yacht video I've ever seen. Because there's nothing like it. No one was crazy enough to put all these components together sure. in three and a half days on a yacht. What people don't know, Mikey and I slept two and a half hours each night. Yeah, That was the only way to pull it off. Every night there would be so much footage to manage. There's so much continuity that you have to worry about because one of the ways to keep the video fluid is jumping from one scene to another and making it flawless. Well, when you have 35 different scenes that you're jumping from, and you're running through this in your head, and then you have a yacht, you have a crew, everybody's walking around, boat is moving, and it's like, you know, it, it takes so much effort. But the way I see it is like, it's a 51 minute documentary that yep. will live forever, document the moment forever. And if you've never been on a yacht, I highly recommend, put on a big screen, enjoy. Yep, yep. <laughs> How did you get Tommy Hilfiger to go on camera? Oh, Andy, how far can I go on this? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Burgess is basically the biggest uh, brokerage company. For yachts. That, for yachts. Yeah. Uh, we have a really good relationship with them and they brought this opportunity to the table. And so they came to you? They came to us. Yeah. They were like, there are a couple of yachts who are interested and Andy is the one generally handling our relationships. And Andy was like, they want you to shoot it. They're excited. They'll pay our costs and all that two days on the yacht. I was like, no chance, no chance. I was like, last time we did that on two and a half days, we died. I was like, I don't wanna do it again. He goes, let me go back. 
He goes back. He goes, okay, I got you three days. Not good enough. I want four. He goes, you know, this is a half a million dollar charter. Yes. You know, his, his team of 17 is going to move this thousand ton asset from one location to another just so you can make this video. I was like, I need four days. He calls me back. He goes, I got you three and a half days. <laughs> I was like, ask them if Tommy's open to doing a video interview. We have a deal. They called back two hours later. They're like, Tommy's interested. I was like, great. Let's fly to Florida. We cooked the entire trip six days before we shot it. Nice. Literally bought the tickets. We first flew to Florida to Tommy's home, literally set up an interview, did the interview straight to the airport, to the Bahamas. We were on the yacht the same day. Nice. Already shooting. So it all came together. And um, the reason I wanted to feature Tommy is a lot of people are very curious of the owners behind these assets. Yes. And these, it literally has a flag logo on the yacht. Clearly yes. it's his yacht. Yes. So it was obviously, it wasn't something a lot of times we sign NDAs or people specifically ask us like, don't mention yeah, don't that it's public. our asset, right? Yeah. I mean, I wish we can. So many of the properties we tour, they're billionaires or very successful individuals. And because he was okay with being in front of camera, I was like, let's do it. We'll make it work. And it turned out fantastic. Nice. So you have so many famous people's assets in your videos, like you said. <laughs> What are some of the coolest homes for celebrities that we might know that you can tell us about? Let's see, that's a good question. I mean, we toured Diddy's old home in Beverly Hills. Yeah. We toured uh, Bruce Willis's old vacation home in Turks and Caicos. What's the craziest thing you've seen in these homes? Like something that's like, wow. Um, craziest things, man, there's, <laughs> it's just like, I mean, so many of them have secret rooms. They're always generally yeah, interesting, rooms panic rooms, exactly. Um, we toured a house in South of France, Cannes, $141 million. Yeah. Had an insane kind of like a moat up front with like three massive pools. That was a crazy property. We toured the one, insane. It's funny, now I'm really good friends with the owner there. Yeah. Um, let's see what else we have. I mean, yesterday was insane. Yeah. What's your favorite part about the penthouse at Center Park Tower? Um, you know what? I really like the observatory. As weird as it sounds, something about that room, the scale and the view corridor and how it's all put together. The ballroom, you mean? No, not the ballroom. On the 129th floor, the small seating area, not the grand living room. Oh, 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 Observe, oh. Yeah. right. So like just kind of that entry seating room. I really like that area. I don't know why. Near I feel like office? that's where I would spend the yeah, most, the right next to the office, yeah, okay. exactly. But to me, the coolest aspect of that uh, penthouse was the mass temper. It's Insanity. Yeah, it's insane. Like the fact that on the 134th floor, you have 12 tons just sitting above the building. Yeah. Technically floating like a pendulum. Yeah, it's crazy. It's insanity. I've never seen anything that cool before. It's the largest one in the world. I mean, it's it's nuts. It's nuts. And it's like, how that's assembled? How did they yeah, get that it's over crazy. there? And how they poured concrete in it? It's like, I have so many questions. And um, that was super cool. Did anyone meet you up there or did you did it by yourself? No, uh, one of the staff members took us up there. Yeah, got it. And then uh, that took a little bit of convincing, but we got up there and yeah. uh, I'm glad we did. And I think a lot of people are gonna appreciate it. Again, it all comes back to, they've spent $3 billion putting the structure together. Yeah. That's insane. Like the amount of commitment and vision and perseverance you need to have to build these things. You have to be crazy. Yeah. Like that's it. Who wants to build a hundred, 40 floor tower in New York City and deal with all the logistics and just logistics alone is a nightmare. Yes. So I admire that. And that's why on my tour is like, here's a beautiful view, but let me show you inside of this cabinet. You know, it's just like, yeah. I can't help it. I end up like talking about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's um what's the what's the tour that you've done that you that I don't know, where the results were the biggest surprise? Like, is there something you've done where the view count was crazy and you yeah. were just like really for that one i like to act fast like yourself mm -hmm. when i know when i have a good gut feeling on something i have a really hard time letting it go sure. like in the morning if i decide something is good in the afternoon we have tickets and we're gone that's it like i can't help it you seem like that kind of person yeah it's just like like the we'll idea just Turkey eats me alive. <laughs> it's like before you know i'm like we just have to do it like first i'll be like hey guys how about going to this location they'll be like when like i'm like 10 days they'll be like yeah we can do 10 days and i'll just come in two hours later well it's five days now and we're going yeah get ready so i had this intuition about like rvs we did like one rv video yes in the past and i was like 
I think people like these, you know, just like, sure, they're expensive, but like, they're super comfortable, they're very efficient, and you can just move them around. And then uh, I remember at the time, I asked my assistant to do some research. He goes, I found two dope RVs. He goes, one problem, they're both in Germany. I was like, really? I thought US was such a big RV culture. Yeah, yeah. They're like, the craziest ones are in Europe. I was really? like, okay. Yeah, Euro trips. Euro trips, fun, a lot of fun. Um, then we we researched, we reached out to them. They were both like, yeah, come to Germany. We'll, we'll open it up, you know? And then I just had this like time clock in my mind. I was like, we have to go there soon. We have to go there soon. And the timing was never aligning. And one day I remember going to Mikey's room. I'm like, Mikey, I think we're going to go to Germany in 24 hours. He goes, you're kidding, right? I was like, no, I'm not. These RVs are small. I think it's me, you plus one, and we just go shoot it. I was like, don't ask me. We're just going to go do it. He goes, how many days? I'm like, we're going to land and we're going to shoot the first one, same day. And then we're going to shoot the other one the second day. And he goes, after that, we're going to fly back home because yeah. we have another shoot. So for two and a half day-ish, we went to Germany and we shot two RVs. One of them has over 30 million views, I think, at this point. That's insane. One of them has like 15 million views. And they went. Like insanity. I I never would I never thought like people would be interested in RVs that much. The amount of streamers that reacted to these videos, PewDiePie reacted to one of them the other day. Really? Yeah. So, and it's been a year and a half to two years since we posted these videos. Still to this day, they get anywhere from 30 to 50,000 views a day. Wow. That's insane. As of right now. That's crazy. crazy. I have wow. no idea. RVs. Why. Who would have thought? And like, you can see, like, if you really look through my eyes, like, I am dead. I'm <laughs> so tired. <laughs> I'm just like holding it together with like a couple cups of coffee. I'm like, you can get through this. I was so tired on both of those shoots, but they worked out. So those were like surprisingly well performing. We did a couple of videos where like we knew they were going to be hits and we really like went hard on them. Like we did um, Goldstein Estate in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Iconic property. We spent two and a half days shooting that. That went that that did really well. Uh, recently, we did a video on Lake Como. We stayed at this property. We invited one of our friends. It was just beautiful. The whole experience comes with a private chef, a private chef, full staff. Yeah, that was really exciting. And honestly, at this point, all of our videos we spend a lot of time on. So, what's next? <sighs> For you, like, where do you I, go? From I, I, I tell you, I tell you, all of a sudden, you're gonna you're gonna do a video that's gonna be like, I quit for real, <laughs> yeah. and next thing you know, like, you're gonna go to law school or something crazy. <laughs> I have a question for you. You know, you have a pretty good idea of what we do. What would you do if you were me? If I was you, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, retire. Sounds nice. Go, go to Europe, hang out, leave me alone, probably <laughs> something like that. No, um, what would I do if I were you? Uh, I mean, listen, it's it's it's. Right, your your audience is a community, right? And so there are people that know you better than you know them. And so I, I think one of the benefits that you have, which I think is really, really a smart decision on, on your team is for you at your stage, it was, you gotta drop the license. It'll make people wanna watch you because people don't wanna be sold, right? It's always a thing that I've had to battle with, but I, I'm too far into it, right? Yeah. Everything I do is a sell and it, it kind of is what it is. Um, uh, but for you, you have that benefit, so I, I think, I don't know, I, I think you just have to really weigh the balance of like the minute you go into selling people something, right? Like it will definitely put like a, I don't wanna say taint, that's the wrong word. It just changes the way people will view everything you do forever. Cause then they're gonna know like, ah, that's why he's there. That's why he's doing it, you right. know? Um, uh, but I think you probably move into different creators, right? And different characters. So it's not just you. That's the only way you're going to be able to scale. Correct. So who's the you of, of NASCAR cars, right? And so it doesn't have to be you. It has to be somebody who's obsessed because they built them for 10 years as kids or something. Like you find that person, right? You sign them into an agency contract with you and you start up that channel and it's under the NSC Mazer brand, right? And so it's, um, I, I don't know. I, th I think that's probably what I do. I think there's uh, far more longevity there where you still don't have to actually sell to the audience, right? but they're being sold at the same time. Gotcha. You know? That's good advice. Um, yeah, because you could do core. I mean, you could do, listen, like everything else will be a, a money grab unless you have like a big, big world view that you think is, is different, that you can really solve a problem. You gotcha. know, so many creators want to make money off their audience 
And that's the reason that they do things. Like it's why you see so many people like they, they write the book, they do the thing, they do this because they just want to make money. Like, oh, let me monetize versus. They want something that they can actually sell. Yeah. Well, a lot of people have that problem actually. Yeah. With yours, it's organic because you're literally touring the products and you have a license. Yeah. But a lot of creators actually have to build something to sell, whether it's merch, course, community, pizza. membership, pizza. Pizza. Yeah, You've been to Dobrik's? I've been to Dobrik's. Well, is actually, it? is it good? We were going to shoot uh, his restaurant, but the day he as was a tour. opening as a tour, uh, he wasn't quite ready. And he's such a perfectionist, David. Um, he was like, let's do this on another day. But then I invited him. David comes to like half of our shoots. It's kind of like a fun fact. Like <laughs> he loves seeing properties. Right. Anytime I have a property where like I'm good friends with a uh, developer or the sure. agent, I just invite him. So I invited him to one of the shoots and he brought Dobrik's. That's why I tried it for the first time. It's actually really good. Is it? Super fulfilling. Like I had one slice and I was done. Like it's one of those like a, not Chicago style, but like a pan pizzas. Um, he's from Chicago. So he's, he's from Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a big pizza guy. So. Yeah. He's stoked. He's like, I don't know why I started this business. He's like, he's like, I want to make sure every single slice that goes out, I want it to be perfect. I'm like, <laughs> there you go. So uh, are you gonna are you gonna tour the the Dobrex in uh, LA? At some point, we probably will. Uh, yeah. But coming back to what's next, I really enjoy making less but better videos. Sure. No matter what I do in life, I have to get better at it. I cannot do the same stuff over and over again. Like I have to have something that I'm chasing, whether it's personal development, pushing the boundaries, doing something that no one has ever done. I have to always scale up. So we've been really enjoying reducing the videos because that really helps us hone in. And I think we're gonna keep reducing them. I think the number 70 is just a figure at this point. That'll yeah. probably go down to 50, 40, hopefully 30 then each one of these videos are like a mini documentary. It's like yeah, people really docs. look forward to it. Exactly. And one of the things that probably most people don't see it right away, but every single agent, every single owner behind these properties, I meet them. Probably one of the most valuable assets we have under our organization is my cell phone. I yeah. just meet these people. And the good part is they all want to become friends with me more than in a way I want to become friends with them. Because the truth is, they have more incentivization coming to me than me to them. I'm not trying to sell. I'm not trying to make commission out of them. So when I call any developer, they pick up the phone right away. Like I have realtor friends calling me say, can you like connect me with this guy? I'm like, yeah. you're a realtor. You call him. He goes, he doesn't pick up my phone call, yeah. but he picks yours. Um, so I think we built an amazing network of individuals that we know, that we call friends, um, that we call them our friends. And I think one of the things that we're considering is online courses. Now, I don't want to sound like, here's our product to sell. When I started YouTube, I took Graham's YouTube course sure. and his real estate course. And it helped me tremendously, tremendously. Like, I cannot tell you how worth it was to buy those courses and watch them and learn from them. And they're really good courses. And I feel like with the amount of knowledge we accumulated, both on real estate side and both on how to start a YouTube channel, and how to build a business or grab a side of YouTube that you can monetize and you can build a business out of, not just by selling products, but working with companies, right? It's a big component of what we do. These brokerages, these agents, these developers fund quite a bit of our uh, company. So I think from a YouTube point of view, both on the editing, video production, sure. we can be tremendous resource to people as well as running it as a business. Yeah. And on the real estate side, I have access to best developers, best agents in the world. And a lot of people consider me as a uh, point of knowledge. So combination of all of it, I think we can put a tremendous product out there that will match our brand because that's really the biggest challenge. Sure. You look at our videos now, we cannot put out a mediocre course. No chance, it's just gonna make everything worse. So our course has to be almost better than our videos where people go, that makes sense. Yeah, That's why they did it, right? Um, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, we're thinking about maybe a clothing company because we now represent a lifestyle as well. And kind of going back to your point on uh, having other people on camera, my team is kind of on camera already. Yeah. You know, and before you know, they're probably going to take more space, and I want them to. Uh, I really don't want it to be just about me. I've never had that intention. That's why I always made it about the houses. It was never about me. And um, between all of that, I think we are diving into more of like the lifestyle. I mean, tomorrow we're going to meet Jacob and Co. You know, it's like this is the world that we're going into now. 
the suit we wear, the watch we wear, the clothing we wear matters. And it's part of our branding now. So I think figuring out a route to pull that more into our world is probably the next thing we're going to focus on. Nice, man. It's exciting. We're looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for Thank doing you. this. Thank you guys for having Thanks me. Thanks for flying I really all the way to it. New York. Our pleasure. Unit was amazing. Yeah, you're I'm welcome. excited to see that video. No, it's going to be good. <laughs> Let's see if we can do a little bit better than you guys. Okay, Oof. get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Podcast over. <laughs>